As you see, we are at the AGI Annual Conference 2022, the first after the pandemic break. So I'm very pleased to see most of participants uh, in person. There is a session on improving global public health through actions on energy, air quality and climate. It's a very complicated and complex issue, but you will, I hope you will bear with us in this morning hour, including uh, participants which are joining us online, participants and also speakers and uh, members of the panel. <coughs> I have a pleasure to invite uh, Professor Kalpana Balakrishnan, Professor of Environmental Health and Director of WHO Collaborating Center in Sri Ramachandra University in Chennai in India, and a member of Global Health Oversight Committee to introduce the session. Right. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really delighted to be part of this session along with Mikhail, uh, focused on making a difference in global public health uh, by, I think, increasing um, the somewhat absent resonance in our efforts to address air quality, energy poverty, and climate considerations in the household sector. And if you can just take a moment to look at these pictures, it's very clear that the need for this resonance is the most obvious and most imminent in low and middle income country settings. But um, as uh, the panelists here will illustrate, it would be a mistake uh, to assume that these challenges or these kinds of considerations, especially the resonance of energy poverty, air quality and climate, do not exist or will not surface in developed countries considering the energy fragility that is um, that is now uh, come to occupy um, uh, the, the global thinking. Uh, but uh, clearly the considerations that are used to weight these three considerations for the purposes of advancing health and global health differ significantly between LMIC and developed country settings. And we are hoping that our lineup, uh, our fantastic lineup of speakers and panelists will share their perspectives to approach this, uh, this, this means of achieving this resonance both regionally and globally. So I just thought I would, as an introduction, um, share some perspectives, particularly from low and middle income countries. So just take a moment again to look at these pictures reliance on solid fuels to serve household energy requirements fulfills a daily subsistence need. And I think this is not to be forgotten for hundreds of millions of people. So if you come to regions like South Asia or Africa, this is, you know, um, this is just everywhere. You cannot miss, it is unmistakably uh, a situation that is begging to be addressed. And this is something that, um, you know, ubiquity in a, in a global sense, you know, may not be so apparent by these maps, but in particular regions, you know, it's not a concern at all. But for some regions, it is like nearly universal. Every member of the population is, ex is at some risk from solid fuel combustion, either through indoor exposures or outdoor exposures. So the second thing I wanted to put in, and so this is not a problem, Heather will be sharing more information. This is not a problem we can wish away or make it go away very soon. Um, uh, you know, unless, um, even if it's 20% of India's population that is currently relying on solid fuels, uh, you know, that's still several hundreds of millions of people. And uh, this does not include uh, energy needs for as, you know, as secondary fuels or uh, for heating and other purposes. So this is just primary cooked fuel use. 
The second thing um, uh, I think it's really important to bear in mind is that this population reliant on solid fuels face multiple other deprivations while the health impacts, especially when we talk about dual challenges from air pollution exposures and climate change that concern every one of us, I think the biggest uh, gap in risk perception, uh, even amongst uh, research communities, is on the scale of inequities and vulnerabilities, and that in turn make impacts highly unequal across countries. 90% uh, of the poorest billion live in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. 80% of the poorest billion are younger than 40 years and live in rural areas, greater than 80% experience five or more deprivations as per the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index. And this includes reliance on biomass cooked fuels, low level of access to safe drinking water and sanitation, limited access to electricity, unsafe housing, and lack of access to education and universal health coverage. And these combined deprivations, as you can see, are all going to interplay each other, whether we are looking at maternal and child impacts or non-communicable diseases. And uh, climate change and air pollution threaten the very existence of these populations by preying on these deprivations. And there is very very little scope for either climate or public health resilience within this population unless massive in country or global um, efforts are stepped up to address uh, their needs. The issue of inequity has dominated our, uh, you know, uh, discussion quite a bit and look at, you know, uh, um, you know, what energy poverty does in terms of gender in inequities that translate beyond health. Here is an illustration of the time poverty. Just look at both men and women. Uh, obviously, you know, much, much greater proportion in women across many countries. Here is data from the World Bank across many um, uh, from the African region, you know, up to four to six hours of the women's time spent in collecting fuel uh, and cooking. Um, so combined, uh, you know, this time poverty is a major, major um, um, uh, consideration. So I want to just conclude uh, to sort of, you know, by posing um, some framing questions, uh, you know, again, the issue of inequity uh, has just dominated our discussion throughout the meeting. But to address this extreme global energy inequity in the household sector, I think we need to approach we need approaches to leapfrog to um, clean energy solutions without waiting for local evidence on health benefits. And many of you uh, who have experience in working in the LMIC settings um, and researchers like me are often faced this question, where is the health evidence? You know, we all recognize from the global uh, evidence pool that evidence on health effects is really hard to pass out. And I think it will be naive to think that the expanding uh, battery of randomized control trials and other research that is underway to address household air pollution are going to provide unequivocal evidence of health gains or that we can actually mount accountability setting studies in these settings uh, you know, within ongoing programmatic efforts. There are big efforts in India, there are big efforts in Indonesia, there are big efforts in Nigeria to in, in, you know, enhance clean energy access. But you know, if, uh, if any one of us is asked to actually mount an accountability study, sure we can, uh, you know, but it's not going to provide these you know, white and black, uh, uh, black and white answers for us to sort of be uh, really mounted. So um, could we just pitch solutions based on exposure reductions that will get us up on the energy ladder and down on the emissions and the exposure ladder and make these exposure reductions health relevant by benchmarking the exposure ladder rungs, at least at the level of WHO interim target guidelines. This will allow us to just, you know, uh, add some immediacy to kinds of actions without actually um, the necessity of um, having to, um, you know, uh, demonstrate concomitantly. Of course, the health benefits will be a part of the uh, part, part of the whole discourse. And could we pitch um, uh, eliminating solid fuels as the lowest hanging fruit for ambient air quality actions for which regulatory standards exist even in the most resource poor LMIC sightings. We have a means of sort of in India, for example, you know, if you were to remove all of household fuels, we think the entire country would be closer to reaching the national, um, you know, standards for PM 2.5. So could we sort of, you know, advance health by 
pitching exposure reduction and pitching compliance to existing standards that are within our means to do that. And finally, I think we should all be asking these questions throughout the two day meeting. As an LMIC researcher, you know, you keep thinking, you know, what are we doing and are we doing enough to create local or regional capacities to A, generate and B, apply science-based evidence from air quality and climate actions. So these are just a few things that and more that the panelists will bring to the table. And we have an extraordinarily um, uh, skilled uh, panel um, and, um, uh, and speakers here. So let me start with introducing uh, the first speaker, um, Heather Adair Rouhani, is the technical lead on um, health and energy, as well as the acting unit head on air quality, energy and health at the World Health Organization headquarters. She has led uh, the establishment of the Health and Energy Platform of Action and the High Level Coalition on Health and Energy. Heather, on to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Balakrishna. And it's, it's always a tough, a tough act to follow. She she gives you such um, energy and and just will that we need to, to 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 change this world and really advance research and advance this issue in the low and middle income countries. Bear with me just a moment while I share my screen, as I have a few slides. Uh, just a moment. Yes, we can see the slides and Perfect. can hear you. Great. Go ahead. Welcome. Welcome. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So again, I'll re my name is Heather Adair-Rohani, and um, I work for the World Health Organization in Geneva. So as I'm going to build upon those wonderful introductory remarks by Dr. Balakrishna and really dive into this energy access and how the adoption of clean cooking, heating, and lighting can really be a tool to protect public health. And it's not only public health from household air pollution, but as mentioned, it's public health from ambient air pollution, climate change. It's a matter of equity. There's just a number of issues in, uh, related. So first is why is lack of access to clean household energy a health problem? Dr. Paul Krishna laid some of this out and specifically billions are exposed every year. So it's not just a small population. We are really billions of people. And these are the billions of people that are the most vulnerable population that have so many challenges each and every day. And these are the people that should not be faced with health risk every time they want to prepare a warm meal, heat a cup of tea, prepare some warm bath water, et cetera, or, or have some light in the evening. And then this leads to millions of deaths annually. This is not a small burden. This is really a huge disease burden associated with this lack of energy access in, in households. And then as mentioned, it is a huge amount of issue for, for there's a gender issues, there's the gender dynamics that women and children often carry the burden. It's also an issue for, for the fact there's climate, environmental issues. It's an equity issue, is it the poorest? So it is really a true public health problem, the energy access. Heather, sorry, sure. we uh, could see your first slide, but uh, they don't change. So, oh, okay. so uh, if you are changing the slides and it is not shown, uh, we can yes, you can stop sharing and we can do it from here. Oh, okay. Um, I changed. Um, let's see. Uh, so. Can you see it now? Maybe the second. Is we that can like hear you, but we cannot. Here's the slides. You cannot see the slides. Okay. So yes, I guess it's probably best for you all to take over as I'm not sure why you're not able to see my slides. I'm very sorry for this. Um, I can try again. Okay. okay, we can see your presenter's view. Okay, let's see if we can get this in. Is How is this? Can you see me move them now? If you can change the yeah. screen. Yeah. Is this okay? We see your presentation mode. So go to change the screen. Yes. Oh, duplicate. So that way. Is that okay? Perfect. Good. Go All ahead. Right. Great. Sorry for that um, technology challenge. Apologies. Okay. So again, this is just highlighting the fact that there, there really is a number of issues, um, a public health issue. So how big is this problem that we're alluding to? It is huge, it is massive. We are talking billions of people each year. 
In 2020, we estimate, WHO estimates around one third of the world's population still relies mainly, again, just mainly on polluting fuels and stove combinations for cooking, and that's cooking alone. So that's that sums to 2.4 billion people in the 21st century that are still having to rely on polluting fuels and technology to meet their basic cooking needs alone. So when we're talking about household air pollution, I think it's really important to make sure that people often refer to it as indoor air pollution and it's to say why we're really using this word household air pollution a little more readily in this past decade or so. And that specifically as indoor air pollution refers to air pollution in specifically a building that includes things related to household fuel combustion, but also includes things related to radon and pollutants on fabrics, et cetera, that would seep into the home. So we really wanted to look into this idea of focusing a little more on this household aspect. So household air pollution, as WHO is, is, is used, is described as air pollution generated by household fuel combustion, leading to indoor air pollution and contributing to ambient air pollution. So it contributes to the air pollution in the environment, but because of the way we cooking practices, the fact that the homes that they're using in, this often leaks outdoors through windows or people are cooking outdoors. People are creating animal fodder, which is also uh, outdoors, et cetera. There's temescals, as we can see below in Guatemala, where people saunas that are used. So it's really a variety of household fuel combustion activities that lead to air pollution in and around the home. And hence what we try to really use this word household air pollution to better capture the, this, this differentiation between other indoor air pollution and to help policymakers really understand where this is, there's the greatest problem. So what is exactly household air pollution made of? And, and it specifically is a very similar to general outdoor pollution and air pollution in general. Um, we, it's a big slew, hodgepodge of nasty materials. Um, when we're talking about household air pollution though, we specifically, there's two pollutants where we have the greatest epidemiological evidence and for which are the greatest pollutants with health damage that are coming off of the inefficient combustions of fuels and technology in the home used for cooking and heating. And that's, particulate matter and carbon monoxide. Um, and specifically when we talk about carbon particulate matter, we're really looking at this fine particulate matter because it's this idea of being exposed day in, day in, day, in, day out to, to high levels of part fine particulate matter, it's breathing that into the lungs. It's going crossing the lungs in, in, in the interstitial tissues and hitting the body and it really impacting it systemically leading to chronic diseases uh, throughout the body and not just the lungs alone. So we really need to consider that there are some very similarities with regular kind of what we consider ambient air pollution and those in household air pollution, as well as similarities in tobacco, smoke, et cetera, from the pollutants. Now, when we, we talk about all these household air pollution, all these nasty pollutants, so what are the specific diseases that they lead to? And this is why do we have these big numbers of deaths that are attributed to these 3.2, which we'll talk about later. And that specifically is that there, these are really important diseases and they're chronic diseases and much of them is non-communicable diseases where we see this epidemiological shift in both high and low and middle income countries to these more longer term diseases, such as heart disease, specifically ischemic heart disease, stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, pneumonia, lung cancer, and cataract. So these are the disease outcomes that we have strong, we feel strong and that we have strong evidence for, for which we quantify disease burden. But in addition, there's a lot of diseases that where we have emerging or suggestive evidence, which is really a growing body of literature each and every day that also connects to household air pollution to other um, health, ill health, such as adverse pregnancy outcomes like short, um, small for gestational age, short, uh, low birth weight, et cetera. Cognitive development. We have there are some studies that are actually showing women, um, pregnant women and children at young ages being exposed to household air pollution, people using polluting fuels and technology over long periods of time, having an impact on cognitive development of children later on. We're also, um, we also see studies in linking household air pollution with tuberculosis, somewhat with mixed evidence, but more, more studies showing a, a negative uh, risk associated with household air pollution and tuberculosis, as well as di diabetes, among others. Currently, WHO is actually reviewing this evidence to see if there is strong enough evidence to better quantify some more of these health outcomes than only those that shown on the left-hand side, the dark blue color. So we have all these diseases, but how big is that impact? How many deaths? We know it's billions of people that are being exposed each year. Well, this leads to not 
tens, not hundreds, not thousands, but millions of deaths each year. And we, we estimate about 3.2 million deaths are attributed to household air pollution from cooking alone in 2019. Um, and these again are accounting for those diseases only with the strongest evidence. Now, deaths are important to quantify, policymakers understand, public understand, but something else that's really important to consider when we're talking about household air pollution is this idea of the um, morbidity. These people carrying diseases, people that have no other risk factors, they're not smoking cigarettes each day, they're not drinking massive amounts of alcohol all the time, but they're still carrying the burden each and every day of, of, of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, heart disease, that's impacting their lives each day. So we actually are, are working to really understand and better understand and quantify these morbidity effects to help people understand um, that this is not just a, 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 an outcome that happens overnight. This is something that people live with and impacts their lives. And WHO estimates about 86 million healthy life years are, are attributed um, to household air pollution exposure each year. And the largest burden, of course, uh, falling upon those women who are um, living in low and middle income countries, as they don't have, as mentioned, many of the risk factors uh, that are common for these diseases. In addition, so this health burdens, this is probably a bit of a, um, an underestimate if you were to consider all the other household air pollution sources in the main cooking fuel and technology, such as space heating, lighting, and supplementary cooking um, to, to, to account for maybe something that the main fuel and technology can't account for. So likely these numbers have accounted for will increase. So in addition to these specific disease outcomes, there's other adverse public health issues associated with household air pollution and the lack of energy access in the home. Safety risks, for example, are one, whereas, for example, simple stoves, rudimentary stoves, actually tip and fall are an leading cause of burns and stalls in low to middle income countries. We also have kerosene, which is often stir stored in, for example, clear water bottles, which children mistake for water and drink and ingest, and, and it's the largest source of thought of in low and middle income countries of low um, childhood poisonings. There's also issues, which we'll hear probably a lot more from Dr. Bayless after this talk about energy supply and deforestation from um, um, defore um, unsustainable fuel harvesting, as well as charcoal production and distribution. We've got the climate pack, so we'll hear as well. It's a very important source of climate, um, sort of climate change and pollutants. Um, and as well as this time burden, as which we heard earlier, where hours are spent daily or weekly that could be spent on other things, uh, uh, such as school, more productive uses, income generation, anything from also just social life and having some kind of time to rest. Um, so these are important things. And as I mentioned, it's not just about cooking. Um, residential heating and lighting with polluting fuels in, um, like kerosene, wood and coal, and, device, and, and, and polluting devices is a major source of household, household air pollution in some parts of the world. For example, in Eastern Mediterranean region, there's actually a lot more kerosene use than we thought for heating, space heating, um, than expected. Japan, it's common. Um, so we really need to be looking at the whole picture because if people are cooking on clean fuels and technology, 90% of the time or 100% of the time, but they still have that open finer in the corner to stay warm at night um, and, to, and et cetera, you're mitigating much of the benefit one would have uh, achieved with the clean cooking because of the other sources of air pollution in the, in the household. And in addition, it's important to consider the household air pollution as mentioned before, leaking outdoors. Often homes using these inefficient cooking systems are, 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 are cooking and they'll have chimneys and it pushes the cooking, the, the smoke outdoors, which just exposes the larger community and increases outdoor air pollution levels as well. Um, in addition, this is actually an important source of outdoor pollution in high income countries, the heating, um, particularly in winter seasons, even in, for example, in California, Northern California, there is a high levels of ambient air pollution caused by residential heating um, during winter months, particularly in Northern Europe as well. And this is also a big energy access issue, for example, Central Asia, Eastern European countries, et cetera, where they may have advanced to clean cooking, but they are still having to rely on very simple heat stoves in the home, which can lead to high air pollution, household air pollution exposure. Finally, just to add, as noted, we have the Ukraine energy crisis somewhat happening and imposing, and we're already seeing it prior to this happening, antidotal evidence because of uh, income issues that households in, in many high income countries are reverting back to, to more polluting systems, for, particularly for space heating due to income challenges and fuel availability. So uh, uh, important issue. 
And as I mentioned again, this it's a so important source of household air pollution too. This is a quick snapshots from the state of global air, where we can see in India, for example, residential biomass burning led was the highest source of outdoor air pollution attributable deaths, and it's specifically in the residential biomass burning sector. And we see the same for China, it just ranked third versus first. So important way, as mentioned, to mitigate house outdoor air pollution is by addressing household air pollution. And again, as mentioned, we'll have the climate linkages and talk a little bit further, but just to flag out um, that, you know, climate change is a public health issue and we work hard at WHO to make sure that climate is an important argument and that household air pollution is a really important opportunity for mitigation of climate change. Um, Short-lived climate pollutants in particular, as it accounts for about over half of, of all black carbon emissions. And this is to highlight some of the inequity issues that were discussed. Um, again, you can see on this graph, this is showing that over the last 20 years, we have seen improvement in um, high income countries, uh, well, in some countries in regarding the actual transition. So we've seen, for example, a gain of some 20%, 25% in the top five most populous low and middle income countries over the last 20 years in access to clean cooking. However, if you look at the, all the other low and middle income countries, we see an increase of literally maybe 3% over the last 20 years. So we really need to make sure that we're not leaving any country behind and that we're really concentrating efforts to tackle this issue in all different places. And that includes doing research in all these different low and middle income countries. This is another us highlighting the geographic distribution of this challenge. Energy access is a public health issue. We actually see improvements in Central Asia, Southern Asia, Eastern Asia, Southeast Asia, for example, where we see India with the Ujiwala scheme, China doing a lot of conversion of households um, to natural gas, et cetera. But we see one alarming figure from this figure, this image, and that is actually Sub-Saharan Africa, where we actually see the people, the number of people without access to clean fuels and technology rising and have been rising for the last two decades. Um, this is largely due to the fact that the population growth in Sub-Saharan Africa is actually faster than the, great, the growth rate in access to clean fuels and technology. So we are estimated to actually see over 1 billion people in Sub-Saharan Africa in the coming years to lack, lacking access to clean fuels and technology, highlighting we really need to be address, attacking this issue there. And finally, people often think as a household air pollution as a rural issue, and this is something that's definitely not the case. Um, we, there is a problem in urban areas, particularly in slums with the lack of access to clean fuel and technology. And actually the gap between urban rural slums is decreasing over the past few years. We're seeing more rapid increase in acceleration access to clean fuels and technology in rural areas, but in urban areas, we see that as a slowdown and the gap between is actually is becoming smaller between urban and rural areas with access. So there are challenges in achieving universal, uh, universal clean energy adoption. And we say adoption here because giving them access is not the same as them using it each and every day because that's where we want the public health protection. So one of the things we had um, produ public produced um, with several of the key panelists um, is this uh, WHO published for the first time the WHO guidelines for indoor air quality household fuel combustion in 2014, which provides specific normative recommendations for how to uh, for the fuels and technologies that can be used in the home to achieve WHO air quality guidelines for pollutants related for guideline levels for particulate matter as well as for carbon monoxide. And these guidelines have been really instrumental in raising advocacy awareness about the issue, but not only raising awareness, making sure that we have the solutions and guidance on how to address that. And these guidelines, a quick summary, as I, uh, in light of time, and this is not the focus of the conversation necessarily, is specifically as it, these guidelines are, have basic assumptions and recommendations, is really addressing all the household energy and uses, so heating, cooking, and lighting, to really um, ensure health benefits. Um, we provide specific targets for particulate matter and carbon monoxide of how the emission at emission levels that a fuel and technology should achieve. Specifically provide guidance against the use of unprocessed coal and discourages the use of kerosene because of the health risk associated with it. And it's this idea of really prioritizing healthier options in the transition. Because we know obviously 
getting to clean cooking is not as easy as flipping a light switch on. And it's going to take some incremental progress. And that in that progress, we should not just wait for the clean solution to be available and ready for everyone, that we should be trying to use some intermediate solutions so that we can be protecting lives and, and prevent disease in the, in, in the, in the transition and the follow-up. And then the final is a good practice recommendation to really highlight the fact that there is opportunity for clean cooking and energy access through climate change mitigation and opportunities there. And with that said, the guidelines really provide one of the hardest targets, and that is getting low enough um, for clean. Um, so many, for decades, people have been claiming they're going to save thousands of lives from indoor air pollution using this amazing stove. Whereas that stove may have improved fuel efficiency, but has nowhere necessarily reduced the emissions to the level that it needs to. And in some cases, actually produces more emissions. So these guidelines that we produce really have been used by the International Standards Organization and working with them to develop specific standards for cook stoves. Because you really need to get low to reduce disease risk. As you can see here uh, on this chart, if you want to protect health, you need to be getting down here where we have a relative risk one, but that's really low emissions um, here where we need to be getting down here where many of the stoves are, 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 are coming out are typically around here, this tier one or even worse open fire. So this is more where LPG, electricity, biogas, that's where we need to get and to getting there is a lot of challenges. And again, mentioning you have to consider the fuel picture, the full picture. Like with, there's many households use a variety of things. I'm sure in breakfast this morning, you all use a variety of different things, whether it's a, an electric kettle to water, warm your water, a stove to heat your food, a microwave, a toaster. There's are, there's are things we all stack, but we need to make sure what's happening is snacking is clean for health and that we can supplement or displace those polluting fuels and technology and make sure that the uses are, all their end uses and needs are addressed. As you can see, this is just an example of a picture of this idea of stacking from the ground in the field in India. You can see here, we have an LPG stove, we have an ele a electric rice cooker, we have a hot plate, we have a kerosene lamp, we have an electric lamp, we have an open mud stove. So we really need to protect household air pollution and we need to be tackling all these and make sure these are clean fuels and technology and clean stacking that's happening. And that's hard. There's a lot of cultural, social barriers, affordability barriers that have to be addressed. Which we highlight, there's three slides on some of the barriers. Cultural beliefs are one as mentioned, People have been cooking this way for hundreds, thousands of years. Why all of a sudden is it bad for the health and they need to change? That's hard for them, people to understand and appreciate. Now we need to figure out how we can sell it. Time savings is important. So that's one way of changing behavior. There's gender norms. Often the person that's selecting the stove is not the person using the stove. So we need to figure out how that we can make sure that the, the purchaser is also the person making sure that it protects the health. How can we use the community? We got to make sure that everyone can really advocate and working together to, to, to pull this clean cooking together. We need to educate people. We need to make sure that the fuels and technology meet the sides of households, et cetera. There's barriers, one of the biggest Heather, barriers. Yeah. Yeah, we're almost up for time. So if you can wrap up in the next minute. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. One, one more slide, two more slides. Um, is the affordability is an issue? You know, households often don't have the money for upfront investment for these technologies and fuels, and so therefore it's really important that we can make sure that they can they, that we can support them. There needs to be financial mechanisms in place. We also need to help them understand the affordability that actually they're going to end up often paying less money for the clean fuels and technology than paying for this one-off fuel, um, firewood, or charcoal sales, etc. So that's something that has to happen. And then we have this idea of factors, other factors, perceived perception of the fuel, clean fuels and technology, safety risks, um, the perceptions of what's expected may not be as, as met, means, 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 may not be met, but it's important to just educate them and understand this. And to flag, there are tools and resources. A health sector can do something. We can bring, convene people together. We provide this normative guidance. We, we're defining, we're really using clean definitions to define global indicators and monitoring um, global strategies. We're working with the energy sector and we have a whole sl slew of tools and resources available for everyone um, to use. And I, I encourage you to check them out. Thank you.
Thank you, Heather. Uh, that was a fantastic overview of um, everything um, and all the considerations to be used as we talk about solutions. Um, so we now have um, Rob Bayless um, uh, to uh, give us the next talk. Rob is a senior scientist at the Stockholm Environment Institute, and his research um, focuses on the relationships between energy, social welfare, and environmental change in developing countries. And his current research focuses mainly on biomass energy, ranging from traditional energy carriers like wood and charcoal to advanced liquid biofuels. Rob. Kapanen, thanks so much. And thanks for uh, the invitation to come and present here. This is my first live conference in over two years. So I hope I remember what to do. Um, all right, so I just wanna go over briefly the, the objectives of this talk. And I was invited to come and speak about this intersection between um, largely biomass dependent energy systems um, environment, climate, and health. And it just so happened that when the invitation came, I was wrapping up about a year-long project that was modeling these very things. So I'm going to be presenting some preliminary results from this year-long um, project that was uh, funded by the Clean Cooking Alliance. Uh, so hats off to them. Um, and uh, done with a, a handful of colleagues and collaborators who I showed very briefly and not giving them due respect on the opening slide, but I'll come back around for my acknowledgements later and you can see the, the list of uh, partners that I've worked with on this. Uh, so like I said, I'm gonna be presenting preliminary results of a new study that's modeling the impact of household fuel choice on air quality, climate, and health. And I'll tell you what I mean by impact. And we're looking specifically at large scale transitions from current mostly biomass-based polluting fuels Oh, sorry, I forgot a conjunction there, to LPG and electricity, which are clean at the point of use, but not necessarily clean upstream. Okay. So I'm going to jump right ahead to the takeaways. So if you remember nothing else, just, uh, just remember some of these points here. So a full transition to clean household energy in low and middle income countries, and we just chose an arbitrary time scale. We chose 2040. Um, it seemed reasonable uh, for all of the, the models that we were trying to put together. Uh, we see a really dramatic reduction, 95% reduction in residential carbon monoxide, PM2.5, black carbon, organic carbon, and uh, VOC emissions. Uh, so from baseline to this transition. Uh, PM specifically, PM2.5, decreases by over six, ton six million tons by 2040. Um, we see cumul cumulative reduction of well-mixed greenhouse gases that we integrate together into a CO2 equivalent of 2.3 gigatons total over that 20-year period. So it's uh, quite a significant reduction. Um, and BC specifically decreases by about a million tons per year by 2040. And we actually, we try and estimate climate through a, a simple climate model that I'll explain a little bit uh, later. And we see a relative cooling relative to business as usual by um, you know, a few tenths of a, of a millikelvin, about a, uh, 10 millikelvin degrees. And I'll explain why that's significant. Okay, so if your caffeine's wearing off and you, you're gonna sort of zone out for the rest of the talk, just take these points away. All right, uh, Heather already went through some of the implications of global polluting fuel use. And I just wanna highlight a few points uh, that she may have missed. When we say collectively polluting fuels, she went through the whole gamut. It's biomass-based, wood and charcoal, coal and kerosene. Uh, but 90% of that, of what people are actually using, is biomass-based. And it's mostly water charcoal with a little bit of crop residues and, and dung thrown in. So when we talk polluting fuels, all of them are relevant, but really what people are largely using is wood and charcoal. And it's re responsible for about 20% of global uh, fine particulate emissions and about 4% of global mortality. All right, if we look at the land use and land cover side, represents about half of the global wood harvest. So when you look around, you see timber at your Home Depot or you see you know, wood construction, that's only half of what people are actually taking off the landscape. The other half is being burned, okay? It's about 7% of global primary energy use. And that's equivalent roughly to combined all of the hydro, all of the nuclear and all of the so-called new renewables, largely wind and solar throughout the world. So about the same magnitude as all of those combined. Um, it represents or it contributes to about 2% of global climate forcing and about half of global BC emissions, black carbon emissions. Okay. And as Heather mentioned, well, uh, Heather was giving largely past data, but you could see if you truncated those graphs, if you, if you extended the graphs of, of polluting fuel users, and we do that here based on some analysis by Oliver Stoner, who's a, a lecturer at Glasgow, along with uh, Heather and her colleagues at WHO, uh, we see that overall polluting fuel use is set to decrease between now and 2050. And of course, these are just guesses, but guesses by fairly well-informed people using fairly sophisticated models. 
Um, so we expect this overall to decrease in coming years, but we expect significant increases, as Heather mentioned, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, between now and 2050, we guess roughly half a billion additional solid fuel users will exist in that region. Okay. So again, as she mentioned, this is not going to go away in the absence of really aggressive interventions. Okay, so now I want to step back, and I know this, this audience is largely health-focused, health-based audience. So I want to step back and just talk about how do biomass fuels, or wood fuels specifically, impact the climate. There's essentially two pathways here. Right? So if this is completely obvious to all of you, I apologize, but maybe it's not obvious to some, so this might be helpful. Okay. When you talk about biomass growth, right, you need sunlight, you need CO2, and you know, some of the other micronutrients, water, et cetera, that goes into growing trees. Um, we're fixing CO2, so this is a possible climate mitigation pathway, and most climate scientists and, and lay people would also agree that planting trees is, is largely a good thing, uh, and it's a possible measure to contribute to climate change mitigation, right? So we're growing trees, we're storing CO2. Uh, when we harvest those, we take some of that, that carbon that's been fixed, we take it home, and either the collector, they use it, or there goes through some middlemen. Maybe it's pyrolyzed and turned into charcoal, which carries some additional emissions that we don't have to get into details about, but it's important to note. Then we burn it, okay? And when we burn it in small-scale devices, like what I'm showing here, it's essentially impossible to fully combust the carbon in the fuel. If we could fully combust it, then we just get CO2, a little water vapor, and well, we'd have issues, but you know, we can deal with those. Um, we don't, so we get these products of incomplete combustion, which include all the, the nasty stuff that's shown in the lower right of the slide, okay? And this includes a mix of both climate forcing emissions, okay, which then contribute to climate change, I'll show in a second, but this is also where the health impacts arise, right? So it's important to think we're burning biomass, we're not doing it well, so we're creating these two streams of carbon, products of incomplete combustion plus the CO2. Okay. Both the CO2 and a subset of those PICs or products of combustion com complete, uh, contribute to net forcing. Also, I should note that if we swapped out the technology and we talked about household heating uh, with biomass or, or other polluting fuels, then the same issues arise. Okay. We can maybe get a little bit better with heating devices than we can with, with uh, cooking, but we don't have to go into those specifics now. All right. Now, so we have the, C the CO2 and the PICs. On the CO2 side, some of that may be fixed again by the next generation of biomass growth. Okay, so only a fraction of the CO2 is actually going to contribute to warming. All of the picks do, or all of the picks that have climate forcing uh, capabilities. Okay, so if you look inside the little CO2 cloud, we see a, a blue section, red section, you know, arbitrary colors. Um, where exactly we fall between biomass regrowth or not depends on what happens at the landscape level has nothing to do with what happens, see if I can get a laser pointer, down there, okay? So this split is happening at this level, essentially. Are we regrowing at the same rate as we're harvesting or slightly less? And uh, along with some other colleagues, I've gone, uh, done a, a bunch of thinking about that, and, and you know, it depends on the landscape, depends on all sorts of factors I can't get into now. Um, but let's, let's assume it's somewhere between zero and 100%, okay? All right, so now we have two paths to climate impacts, and that's what I'll focus on. Uh, for a little bit now, one through the products of incomplete combustion that occurred, oops, occurred down here, and one through the split of CO2, a decision that's largely influenced by what happens here. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about the land management stuff anymore. We can come back to it during Q&A. I will talk about what happens here and the interventions that you can uh, imagine, and that's really what we, we modeled in this, uh, in this research. Okay. So we'll call those demand side interventions. So what's happening at the level of the user. And I have a really complicated table that I pulled from a paper by Ipsita Das and, and, and colleagues. Um, and I don't want you to focus on all the details here. Just keep in mind that uh, cooking gas or LPG and electricity, those are the most prevalent sources of clean household energy in use in low middle income countries today. And if we roll forward, unless there's some really dramatic and aggressive and effective interventions, that's what people will be switching to in the near term in the future. Okay, so we're going to focus on those. We're going to focus on moving from a traditional biomass stove, wood burning, or a charcoal stove to those two options. Okay, those options, those are options that WHO defines as clean. Some of the others are also highlighted in green here. Um, and they're based on, they're, they're defined as clean based on what happens at the household level, on the exposures that are likely to occur when people use them. Okay, but they're fossil based, 
or they're electric, but from fossil, fossil dominated grids. Okay, in most of the world, we have you know, roughly 40% of electricity globally is from coal in some key countries. It's more like 75 or 80%, China, India, South Africa. Okay, or they're bio-based, um, which are potentially renewable, but not zero impact. So even if we're not going to achieve large scale transitions, in some countries, those are relevant. And so we should think about what the impacts are from them as well. But for this talk, I'm focusing on these options. Okay, so a big question, what happens if two and a half billion people go from just a generic biomass based option that you see on the left to either gas or electricity or a combination of the two? That's the big question. Okay, so to answer this question with my colleagues, we gathered fuel specific LCA's life cycle assessment. So life cycle data looking at from extraction all the way through to use, um, life cycle data for all of the fuels that might be uh, either currently utilized or used in the future and develop three groups of scenarios. So one is business as usual that's based on current trends. Okay, and we used WHO analysis that was again led by this, uh, this chap Oliver Stoner from, from the University of Glasgow um, to extend current trends into the future in a reasonable way. Okay, so we didn't want to try and simulate what happens if you instantaneously switch, that's completely unrealistic. Right? So we have a switch that plays out over time. We compare BAU to these other transitions. So a full transition to LPG, a full transition to a combination of the two, LPG and electricity, or a full transition to electricity. And we look specifically at national electricity systems so we can get as realistic as possible and try and understand, okay, what happens if you, you know, switch out, say, wood for electricity in South Africa, a heavily coal-based grid, or what happens if you do it in Kenya, which is a fairly clean renewable grid. Okay, and those are different, of course. Um, I should also acknowledge that the full transitions are totally unrealistic. It's not going to happen, all right? But it's still worth walking through the exercise just to see what's the upper bound, what's the absolute uh, upper bound of impact in these various categories, you know, if we were to uh, actually experience this full transition. And then we developed some intermediate transitions that are maybe a little bit more transit, uh, realistic, say, based on what stated national policies are in some of these countries. Okay, and then we took a handful of existing models, right? We didn't have that many resources. We don't have that much brain power at our disposal. So we, we took off the shelf models, but none of them are exactly suited to this. So each one needed a little bit of um, tweaking that again, I won't go into details here. Uh, one is a climate model called FAIR that's developed by Chris Smith and colleagues. Uh, he's, at, um, he's at Leeds, but uh, colleagues from Ox, uh, Oxford and Exeter as well. Um, one's a health-based model called Abode, which is the next generation of Habit, if anybody's been working in this space, uh, developed by Ajay Plarasetti and colleagues. Um, he's currently at Berkeley. And then we also looked at additional costs and benefits to try and monetize this and, and understand, is it, even if it's unrealistic, is it, is it a feasible investment at a societal level? So looking at the cost of new infrastructure, looking at fuel costs, looking at time saving, some of the other things that uh, that Heather mentioned that are relevant for working in this space. And that we, for that, we used a, a cost benefit model called BARHAP that was developed and by, um, by Ipsita Das and Mark Julin, who are at Duke, uh, plus uh, Heather and her colleagues at WHO, possibly others. Okay, so several scenarios and mainly three models. Okay, uh, this graph looks a lot like the graph that Heather put up, uh, I think, or maybe Kalpana put it up um, at the beginning of the session. And essentially, these are the countries that we're working with. We drew out an arbitrary cutoff. The countries to be included had to have a million or more polluting fuel users. We used 2018 as a base here because that's the, the data set that we originally had. Uh, it includes 77 countries, about two and a half billion people in uh, 2018. Okay, so it's not quite global. Um, and then just to show what these scenarios might look like, I have an example from Kenya where we draw out the BAU scenario. Again, that's looking at current trends. And this is counting fuel users looking at current trends and rolling them forward, we, we roll them through 2040. Okay, so you can see the business as usual, the clean stuff is on the, uh, on the top. You can't see electricity because there's very little electricity used uh, for cooking in Kenya, but if we put up another country, South Africa say, it would be a significant chunk. Uh, and the clean option there is essentially LPG. And you can see it, it's got a, a sizable fraction uh, today, 2020, and it's projected to grow a bit, into the future, okay? Uh, we made this intermediate transition where we just put an arbitrary kink and add the LPG in, and then we have a full transition, again, totally unrealistic, but interesting from, a, from an intellectual perspective, uh, where and we have the, the population 
completely using it by 2040. Okay. Uh, and I'm just going to jump right ahead to the punchline. So we did, well, actually, let's back up one step. So we did this for every country. Basically, every country of the 77 in the sample, I could generate a graph that, that shows you what these transitions look like. And each one's going to be a little bit different because each one, well, their current trends are unique to the country. So we follow through with current trends for BAU, et cetera, et cetera. So we have essentially 77 of these. We can also split by urban and rural. Um, you know, didn't want to go into that level of detail here. Um, so when we take all those countries and move them back together and run it through our, well, this, this, is, this is output from our climate model, but basically inventories emissions. Um, so what we can see, we have the baseline, oops, baseline situation here. And here we're looking at CO2 equivalent. So all of the well-mixed greenhouse gases weighted by GWP or global warming potential. Uh, this is what would be happening in, in the baseline year. Uh, and this comes to about 2% of global uh, well-mixed greenhouse gas emissions, uh, between 1% and 2%. Uh, under the BAU scenario, it increases by a bit. And then under our uh, successful scenarios, it decreases. So we're emitting less CO2 and other well-mixed greenhouse gas. I can break down by gas, but uh, it's not the, the key point. So, so and the, the reductions relative, and then we're comparing what happens in BAU to these other scenarios in 2040. And the reductions by the final year are between 17 and 47%. So roughly one sixth, sorry, roughly five out of six uh, tons to, to about a half reduction. Okay, so that gives us a little bit of a climate benefit, but the real payout comes in a uh, reduction of uh, black carbon, which under the clean scenarios is nearly eliminated. Okay, even with electric systems as they are now, they're a lot cleaner than uh, very inefficient cooking fire on the floor. So you don't see nearly as many uh, aerosols emitted, okay? And that's gonna have a quick near-term climate payout. Okay, so we ran this through uh, this, this uh, climate model called FAIR, and uh, what I'm showing here are temperature changes from BAU. So what we do is subtract out what happens if there's no emissions from the sector. We add in our BAU, okay? And we look at the difference so we can attribute, we can, we can estimate what the temperature change is specific to this sector, for, first for our business as usual, and then for our other scenarios, okay? And what we do is we estimate that emissions mm -hmm. specifically from these 77 low and middle income countries under business as usual will contribute to about 24 millikelvin of warming by 2040. To give you a sense of what is projected, that's about 7% of the warming that's projected from now through 2040 under one of the multiple climate scenarios, the RCP 4.5 for anybody who follows this. Okay. A full transition to clean cooking will be roughly 10 millikelvin cooler. So it's not zero impact. It still has some warming impact, but it has less warming impact than we would see under business as usual. Okay, so about 10 millikelvin cooling if we were to follow this completely unrealistic, granted, pathway. Okay, but we also see that we've sort of turned a curve, and that's the more important takeaway, I think. So not only will we be cooler, and, and you can picture these with wide uncertainty, we're still sort of trying to figure out how to, how to calculate and then, and then present the uncertainties in here. Um, but you can see that whereas the business as usual continues to increase, even although at a, at a slightly lower rate, and so does the, the intermediate scenario, the full scenario is you've turned a corner. So we're actually on, our, on a downward trajectory for warming impact from this sector. So that's, that's the important takeaway here. Even if the uncertainty is large, the trajectory change is still realistic. Okay, so that was climate impact. Now to look at the, the health impact. Um, here I'm just, again, inventorying health damaging emissions uh, that we might be concerned about. Okay, and the two that Heather highlighted, uh, fine particulates and, and carbon monoxide are also nearly eliminated, even with these fossil-based options, okay? It's a lot easier to control emissions in a, at a power plant than it is to uh, control them on a, you know, again, a fireplace on the floor. Um, however, some of the other health relevant pollutants, SOx and NOx, actually increase a bit, okay? But health impacts from, from these pollutants are not nearly as grave as they are from 
super high levels of exposure to PM 2.5. So I'm not writing these off, I'm flagging them as something that we should be thinking about. Um, in addition, these have a climate cooling impact. These are negative climate forces. So they actually help us for our, for our climate impacts if we were concerned about those things. Okay. Um, we also estimate specific health impacts, but not at a global scale. We do this uh, at a country specific level because it, there's just too many assumptions that would be needed. And again, we don't have the resources or the brain power to do it. Uh, so we looked at four countries that the Global Alliance, that the Clean Cooking Alliance um, was specifically interested in. Uh, and Kenya is one of them. Um, and we use this model again, developed by, um, by Ajay from, uh, from UC Berkeley. And specifically for Kenya, under a business as usual scenario, the mortality, I'm just showing mortality here. We could also show um, dailies, but mortality is projected to increase to about, by about 3,300 deaths per year by 2040. And under these full, uh, either the intermediate or full transition, we have between four and 7 million fewer polluting fuel users and mortality is projected to decline by six to 10,000 per year. Okay, and these are using uh, integrated exposure response curves developed by WHO, uh, et cetera. Okay, so just some closing thoughts. Um, again, using models and scenarios that are completely, completely unrealistic, but I think still interesting from, a, from an intellectual perspective. Transitions from mostly fueled and charcoal to LPG or grid electricity, or grid electricity result in net near-term cooling of about 10 millikelvin over 20 years. Near elimination of most, but not all health damaging pollutants, slight increases in NOx and SOx, reduced morbidity and mortality, and I didn't show you any of these results from a cost benefit because I don't have time, um, but the benefits in most cases outweigh the costs if you think about all the other um, impacts, the cost of adding new infrastructure, the cost of purchasing fuels where they maybe used to be collected, time saving, et cetera. So in most scenarios, costs uh, are greater, than, uh, sorry, the benefits are greater than the cost. Okay, and I'm gonna leave this dangling, but it's a fossil-based transition. And that still gives a lot of people pause. And that's something that, I want to just leave dangling and and you know maybe plant a seed for for discussion. Thank you, Rob. Um, uh, to the, we we do have time for a couple of questions. If anybody wanted to come up to the mic um, for the two speakers, and then before we open it out to the panelists, Mike. Um, thanks, Rob. Mike Bauer from UBC and IHME. Um, two questions. One, um, what were your, your assumptions actually about cooling versus warming aerosols related to the biomass combustion? Because there's controversy about cooling and warming in the biomass. And then the second question is, did you look at, my understanding would be that climate impacts are much greater in terms of regional climate than global. And did you look at impacts on regional weather? So just take one at a time, I guess. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I have basically an easy answer to that. And the answer is I can't answer that. Um, well, I, I can answer, but not in detail. So this is all in a, in a package climate model that's meant to be simplified and usable by you know, folks who aren't really climate modelers. So the assumptions are, are baked in essentially, and it's not spatial. So I've seen you know, other, other analyses that look specifically at uh, the impact from polluting fuels, let's say, or, or wood fuels, um, but they typically just turn that off and don't turn on what, uh, what people would be using. Um, so, and they do show regionalized differences. Um, our model can't do that. So, so there's not a good answer to that. And the, the relative cooling versus warming, again, these are, these are baked into the model. Um, and I think some of our, some of our temperature, our near-term temperature change, um, it's driven by the, the rapid turndown of uh, BC and actually an uptick in some cooling agents. So we're not just turning off the BC, like you know, some of those that the, the models that come out as, as indeterminate are, like I said, withdrawing both warming and cooling agents because they just take the biomass out of the picture. But we're actually taking biomass out, but then adding some, some additional kick for, for cooling forces. And so that's, I think, why we see the, the near-term cooling uh, as big as it is. Hi, Rob. 
Long time no see. Uh, hi, I'm Michelle Bell from Yale. My question is also for Rob. Thank you so much for sharing your work. And I know you didn't talk about the uh, cost benefits, you didn't have time, but I would like to give you the opportunity to share some of that with us. And I was interested in your closing remarks, how you said that the benefits outweigh the cost most of the, in most cases. Mm -hmm. And so can you just uh, share a little bit more about the the benefits and costs analysis, your insights onto that. Thank you. Right. Thanks. So that is a, it's a national level analysis. And so you need at, you know, at the courses, national level assumptions. Um, and when I say most of the time, it really boils down to how much does charcoal cost in a given place? Um, and how much does the the replacement cost? And those are those are national questions, and that, that's the biggest. Another would be uh, another factor would be how much infrastructure already exists in the country to you know to say uh, handle and distribute LPG, which as clean energy sources go, it's one of the more yeah. uh, one of the cheaper ones to put in. But if there's zero infrastructure, then you have to factor that in. So in a country like Kenya that has had LPG on the market for several decades already, uh, it's the, the model we build today uh, has far fewer infrastructure costs than a place like, say, Zambia, which has very little LPG infrastructure. So it's, it boils down to those kinds of questions. The time savings are, are like an unambiguous winner, um, you know, at least based on our assumptions. It's the other, those other things that are really uh, country specific. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, we have a question from one of our online attendees for Rob. Um, so Alison Gowers is asking if you've looked at the additional benefits, if the transition to electricity happened at the same time as the grid was transitioning to renewables, mm -hmm. and if the use of, you know, local renewable electricity generation versus relying on a national grid, and what those, you know, scenarios might look like. Right. So I didn't mention this. I should have. Our electricity assumptions we, we use some data from the IEA uh, that comes out uh, in the World Energy Outlook's annual reports um, that project what the grid might look like in a couple of decades. So we use their stated policy scenario for, for electricity. Um, so we are assuming grids get cleaner over the two decades of our, of our model and mostly by transitioning, well, actually from coal to gas and then from uh, also folding in renewables, it depends on, on which country. So we did factor that in, but not at the cost benefit stage. Um, that was just in our climate model. Um, cost benefit, again, it's very country specific. So uh, as a rule in L LMICs, electricity is generally more, sorry, renewables are generally more expensive than grid options, although it's, it's gonna vary from, from one place to another. So no, we didn't it would probably make the cost benefit slightly worse, but in places where the, you know, the grid is costly and renewable options are, are not, or you know, if the, the relative trade-off of the two favors renewables, then it would obviously skew your cost benefit the other way. Could we request to, for you to hold on because we wanna give the panelists a chance because we have four panelists uh, in sort of um, answering many of these yeah. questions, and, and we can I'm come back, and we can come back, you know, at the end of the discussion. So, Mikhail, thanks. Many thanks to Heather and Rob for the introductory presentations. We are now turning to the uh, panel discussion, and besides the lectures, we'll have a uh, four. Uh, panelists. Uh, we have uh, Sumi Mehta here present uh, at the table. Sumi uh, is a global health professional at Vital Strategies with over 20 years of experience working at the intersection of air pollution, health, and development. She has ex expertise in epidemiology, exposure assessment, comparative risk assessment, and cost effectiveness analysis, extensive field experience around the world. So this, she is the first panelist. We also have um, online um, Paul Wilkinson. Paul Wilkinson is a professor of environmental epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He is 
His primary research interests are in climate and health, including the ancillary consequences of the low carbon transition, environmental pollution, and urban environment. Uh, Paul, are you with us? I don't see you on the screen. Just I'm say with hello. You. Hello to everyone. Good. Welcome. Uh, the next panelist is uh, Shonali pa uh, Pachauri. Is a research group leader of the Transformative Institutional and Social Solutions Research Group in the Energy, Climate and Environment Program of the Institu International Institute of Applied Science Analysis. Very long uh, title. But uh, her work explores policy pathways for achieving universal access to basic services and technologies and assesses wider impacts of this for sustainable development. Shomali, are you, are you with us? Yes, hello. I'm delighted to join the panel. Nice to meet you all. Welcome. And uh, last but not, not least, uh, Anna Stoilowska, who is a, a research fellow at the Institute for Political Science, Center for Social Sciences in Hungary. The research interests include a human-centered approach for studying energy poverty in the context of a socially just energy transition, questions of justice or injustice, and equity concerning infrastructure, heating, and fuel use, as well as uh, new govern governance model models uncovering systematic drivers of energy vulnerability. So we have um, the panelists uh, and uh, lecturers, and we want to focus uh, our discussion on uh, mostly on health. As you notice, it's very what the subject of the session is very broad, is uh, ranging from basic economic issues uh, through climate. Uh, air pollution and health. But the first issue uh, here is um, to what extent the knowledge on health effects, uh, which we have and which lecturers demonstrated, could and should be used as the argument for this clean energy transition, I mean, stepping up the ladder of, uh, of energy sources or stepping down the ladder of pollution and uh, also climate forcing. Um, what the panelists think about using this argument, to what extent um, it is not only a theoretical concept, but to what extent it really is practical in all those, uh, in all the situation. And I want to emphasize uh, the relevance of this issue, uh, especially in this time, uh, in, in many countries, which uh, I would say even are scared or are concerned at least, uh, not only about the current or past impacts, but also perhaps of future impacts uh, of rapidly growing uh, energy source prices, shortages on the market, um, also shortages on, on the market of uh, high income countries, which of course will suck out resources from low income countries. So it's, we are all in, in those uh, connecting, uh, in this connecting economy. So um, this transition to cleaner fuel may actually be hindered by, by this, uh, and especially in those low-income countries. So the question is, first question uh, is, in this difficult situation, uh, how much this health argument matters? 
Uh, so me, we start with you here. Sure. Um, and really, thank you um, to the presenters for really thought provoking and really, um, you know, information packed um, presentations of a very complicated uh, topic. Um, so I, I just want to start by, you know, saying that I think it's really tricky sometimes to think about where health fits into some of these intersectoral policies that we're grappling with, with respect to household energy. Um, but I think what we've seen is it's quite clear that a lot of these innovations, um, which are really perhaps considered green from an environmental perspective are unfortunately not really clean from a health perspective. And that's where we really need to focus on seeing what we can do specifically to minimize biomass burning in order to really reduce exposures and protect health. I think, you know, um, Rob mentioned, for example, how even with just continued demographic trends, we're going to see increases um, within Sub-Saharan Africa in the number of people who are actually using solid fuels, um, mainly for cooking, but also for heating in some cases. But I think we also need to emphasize that in many places, if you think about Eastern Europe, if you think about China, there's already been this sentiment that the cooking problem has been solved, but the heating challenge really remains. And um, moreover, I think what we've seen um, in many areas around the world is that with the pandemic, with um, increasing civil unrest in some places, we actually experience reversals in energy use. Um, and, and really, um, you know, these make people revert to um, a reliance on, on, on you know, biomass um, used for, for cooking and heating, um, which also, you know, we, I think there's been a lot of interest, of course, as you've seen with, you know, the impact of the pandemic on air quality and health, but these are really situations where we've actually seen increases in exposure inequities and health effects as well. So, um, you know, definitely something to consider. And, you know, the other thing to consider is that I think we, it's really clear that when we're considering the urban air quality management, um, that this really requires a focus on the regional contribution from rural areas. Um, and, you know, because you're not going to be able to fix the air quality problem in many cities unless you're able to actually address these regional sources. But again, as we do this, um, urban air quality is super important, but most importantly, I think from a health perspective, we also need to think about improving air quality wherever the people are. And we know that there are hundreds of millions of people who are actually living in those rural areas whose air quality also um, matters and is, is largely driven by biomass burning in many cases. Thank you, Sumi. Uh, let's continue um, around the table. Perhaps uh, Paul uh, Wilkinson, uh, what you what is your position on on this uh, issue? Um, thanks. Well, it's a, it's a complicated issue, um, and I think the uh, the current context has um, really focused attention on uh, various aspects in a way which. Uh, I think a few years ago, we would not have uh, really foreseen. My view is that um, the, the current uh, pressures that have arisen both post COVID and from the war in Ukraine are now putting a, uh, forcing a focus on the short term protection um, of um, energy security at, at state level, but also the impact that, that has pushing down onto a cost for poor members of, of uh, communities right across the globe, not just in low and middle income countries, but in high income countries too. At this current stage, um, one of the consequences that's been happening is that um, there has been some rollback, um, new oil and gas fields uh, plans have been opening up again that were hitherto uh, scheduled for closure. Um, some countries in Europe have, have opened up coal capacity, which was also being scheduled for, uh, for closure. Um, production of, of, of coal in, in China and India has reached record levels. Um, all of which has arisen because of the increase in, um, in price, uh, global prices, and which has knock-on consequences right across the, across the board. In the short term, all of that has been propelled because of very obvious imperatives to uh, deal with the, um, the fuel price shock, which is probably as greatest as we've seen since the uh, 1973 and 1979 with the Middle Eastern uh, uh, oil crisis. Um, 
but it has the unfortunate consequence that uh, many of those actions also have the potential to embed uh, depends on fossil fuels and hence uh, the, track, the track for both climate change and for air quality for many years hence. Most, most large uh, companies won't invest in these things uh, expecting, well, unless they can expect a 30-year uh, lifetime or more of those investments. The crucial thing at the moment for a transition, which would help most economies around the world, is capacity to use gas as a transition uh, fuel. And that's essentially based on um, capacity of um, storage of liquefied natural gas. And both Europe and Asia have substantial undercapacity in uh, storage capacity for liquid uh, uh, natural gas. And that means that any transition over to the, to the true uh, outcome that's desired to shift towards renewables um, is going to be made much more difficult. And for the time being, we're going to be dealing with all of these uh, rather intermediate measures. The overall objective, I think, at least in the higher income countries, is, is becoming more clearly set. Um, but it also entails some rather dramatic changes. Um, long term, the transition overall is a shift towards electricity rather than uh, burning of fossil fuels, including for home heating. Um, but energy, but electricity prices, for example, for the UK, a kilowatt hour in the UK of electricity costs 28 pence gas costs just seven pence. And making a transition uh, over to electricity for all of our needs is therefore going to entail substantial implications for, uh, for society in general, but of course, for uh, the heating costs, uh, energy costs for the poor members of society. So it's a complex mix. And I think it has, it has knock-on consequences right way down the, uh, the, the sort of the energy ladder and the social ladders. Uh, in, the, um, in the impacts that we can expect from them. And I see at the moment, it's a rather delicate balance of trying to negotiate this way through a temporary transition where we are trying to defend against the, uh, the pressures from global events that are leading to a huge uh, uh, pressures on energy prices. But then the long-term vision of how we use that to achieve what's needed, um, essentially the long-term transition, which is much more focused around electricity, energy efficiency, um, and the renewable domains, which uh, uh, we know so much about. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we turn to directly to uh, Sean Ali Patrouli. Um, what is your perspective um, on, on this uh, health argument? Is it valid or should we the primary argument how you see it. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, uh, a lot has already been said, but I mean, I think we all <laughs> can say quite unequivocally that we all agree that health is central to all of these issues that we're talking about. Uh, we've heard already about how unequal and inequitable, inequitable the impacts are, uh, in both in terms of health and other uh, impacts, and that those who are impacted really suffer from multiple deprivations. And this has been the case even before we've had the pandemic, even before we've had the, the war. And now we are in a very unprecedented time when we've first had the pandemic since 2019, and now we have the Ukraine invasion by Russian Federation. And basically, consequently, this is having impacts on the economy, on uh, fuel prices, as has already been mentioned, and fuel availability. Uh, and it's really increasing inequities and it threatens also to reverse some of the gains we've seen on some of the SDGs in the last years. Um, actually, uh, oddly enough, before the war happened, we did a, a study last year where we tried to look at the impact of the COVID pandemic uh, on clean cooking fuel access globally. And for this, we developed a very rich model, which is a simulated structural e econometric model that explicitly accounts for household affordability. And, and uh, you know, we simulated a number of scenarios there, and we really found that close to half a billion people could be pushed into cooking fuel poverty by 2030 in a very pessimistic economy recovery scenario. Now, of course, this was, you know, sort of an extreme e pessimistic economy recovery scenario. But even 
you know, if we were not to consider that, the, we know the world is off track with the SDG 7 target for clean cooking access. And it's very clear that the slow pandemic recovery could slow down this effort even further. We are seeing that already. Uh, and this will be the have having the worst impacts on populations that already are lacking access the most and will then therefore become even more unable to afford clean cooking access, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and parts of Latin America, where um, you know, these impacts will be felt the most. And, and just uh, if we want to put this in the context of India, you know, we did quite a lot of work also on looking at the Ujwala Yojana pro project a program that India launched in 2016. And of course, this has been very successful in increasing connections to LPG. But again, even prior to the pandemic and prior to the war, we were seeing very clearly that uh, while connections have increased enormously, we are seeing that people are not buying refills regularly, right? So we don't have the transition to completely substituting away from the solid biomass fuels. People are stacking fuels. They are not buying the refills uh, regularly. And then we now know also we are in a situation where we've had one and a half years of LPG price increases in India. And as of June of this year, the full subsidy has been removed. Only for the Ujwala beneficiaries, they get 200 rupees uh, into their pockets. And, and that's not even one fifth of the cost of LPG today in, in India. So in other words, the poorest households are spending over 15% or would have to spend over 15% of their household budget, 15% of their household budget on clean cooking alone. Yeah. And they have to deal with inflation on food prices and many other you know, uh, consumption items as well. So it's very clear that we are now in a situation where we are at risk of undoing the gains that we have had in recent years. And uh, that means we're also going to see further impacts in terms of health, uh, in terms of all the other pollution and, and climate impacts that we've talked about. So I'll stop with that for now. Thank you. Yes, we are touching the affordability of uh, not touching. I mean, it is in the center. It's the elephant in the in the middle of the room. Of course, um, we need to acknowledge it and and somehow tackle it. Um, Anna, um, what do you think? Uh, I, I don't. I mean, we have this elephant. I don't want to emphasize it now. But remember about it. To what extent this health argument? can go around this, <laughs> this elephant. Uh, how important it is uh, also from your perspective. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to contribute to the conference. And um, I also would like to thank the, the panels who really set up the scene so I could I have my job is much easier. So not to repeat things, so my kind of um, input would be mostly about energy poverty. So I'm a social scientist studying energy poverty, and I will bring some kind of examples uh, from qualitative research done in Europe. And uh, mostly I would also discuss as how energy poverty is an environmental and health uh, issue. Uh, so just to maybe um, uh, uh, describe, so every, all the uh, nice photo, photo, photos we've seen of the conference kind of a visualize what energy poverty is. And unlike maybe in the global south, in the global north, um, especially in Europe, um, energy poverty is mostly about the, um, not the, it's not a problem of energy access, but it's more about the quality of the fuels and definitely heating is one of the mostly, the most problematic energy services. And um, this um, energy injustice, which is energy poverty uh, is, um, stimulated by um, issues like low energy efficiency of the dwelling, the, uh, high energy prices, which are now definitely uh, one of the driving factors 
which was also mentioned by uh, the previous discussion, and also um, issues like um, low income and material deprivation. But it's also shaped by decisions uh, made in the past, uh, path dependencies around um, decisions around the infrastructure. So if there is no developed district heating, uh, and then um, sometimes households, even if they want to uh, use modern fuels, they have no other um, uh, no other um, opportunity but to use um, uh, fuel wood, for example. And uh, what I would like to maybe uh, mostly focus on the how the health plays here uh, in Yishun, basically. So from my point of view, health is an outcome. Uh, it, it can be also a factor like um, um, households in which there is a uh, someone with um, uh, with health uh, uh, with health issues, then of course increases the the costs uh, at the households and can uh, lead or can increase the risk of energy poverty. But mostly, it's very interesting to see as a, as an outcome. And what um, energy poverty really brings in is the, the so-called coping strategies. So what I want to so we've seen all the very interesting um, uh, calculations and kind of a technological approach how we can. Uh, replace fuels and maybe what are the costs needed and the CO2 emissions that we can uh, see from it. But what, um, but when it comes to what happens at the household level, the story is much more complex. Um, so it is definitely about the being exposed uh, to indoor um, pollution and also contribution to air pollution. But it's also um, issues like mental health because households are so stressed out about not being able to, to pay their bills. Uh, for example, mostly for electricity would be in Europe, um, and also are maybe uh, unable to, to heat enough um, uh, th their dwelling, and it uh, brings to a general anxiety and kind of a worry to, to uh, make ends meet, which also leads to their uh, exclusion from society, so there is also kind of a, a social exclusion that comes, um, uh, that comes in play. And um, it's definitely is the same as uh, maybe not so uh, not so visible, but it's also a story of uh, uh, gender inequality, uh, social and energy um, energy inequality. So I will stop here and looking forward to the further discussion. Thank you. Uh, I turn to my culture, asking if she has some points to add. Yeah, just a very brief one. Um, I think, um, you know, it's clear from all the panelists' responses that health is the driver, but, you know, health is not something that these communities who are experiencing these exposures can think about. Somebody else to, else has to think about it for them. And the way we think about getting health to these communities, you know, using the resources we have. And so this is the central question. You know, we have, we want to make cell the central argument, but who is going to take the, uh, take this argument to these communities? So um, we, I think we have to be very mindful of that and to sort of uh, strategize some risk communication uh, tools in a way that the people who are going to provide this assistance, whether it is development assistance, whether it is, uh, you know, other kinds of, uh, you know, policy uh, implementation assistance. And one thing uh, to be very mindful of is um, not to have the health evidence uh, be held to standards that are either impractical are not uh, higher than you know what it has taken to achieve similar kinds of compliance in the ambient air pollution setting, for example. So, so I think one has to be sort of very mindful of uh, taking the health evidence we have and increase the pitch and the um, and the confidence with whatever health evidence we have out there and lay it on as a central driver. And I think we, if we just get plagued down by the uncertainties in the health evidence and sort of, you know, uh, the need for local evidence, we run the risk of, you know, uh, setting it back purely on affordability considerations. It is not affordable right now for many countries, many uh, certainly for the community. So, so this is just a, uh, almost a plea to the to the to the entire community to sort of really not um, not make it uh, contingent um, um, uh, pass this responsibility on to individual uh, countries. Um, you know, it has to be sort of a global effort to sort of increase the pitch on the health narrative. We are all concerned, 
but uh, we need to be doing more to get the help that these communities deserve. Thank you, Kalpana. Uh, our presenters, uh, and then I will ask uh, the audience to to contribute to the con uh, con uh, to the discussion. Heather, do you have something to add, very briefly? Sure. I just want to add this whole health argument. It is it is something that needs to be leveraged in the appropriate way. I feel that you know we at WHO we're really working and using this health argument not necessarily as a way to, as a, you know, we, we see the research suggesting that maybe the health households, as mentioned, they have a lot of risk and other competing issues to worry about. But at the policy level, we find where we can really bring ministries that might not necessarily want to be talking to each other because they have different mandates. But when you bring in the health argument as a, a common denominator, that the, you will, policymakers can come and we're able to convene often policymakers together that haven't worked together before at all to really discuss this issue and take actions. And it helps also create this common, yeah, common dialogue as well as that people are all achieving and not aiming to work fuel efficiency for one reason or another, but common health that want to reduce emissions for health. But then you have the climate, the environment, they're all benefits that come around this. So I think that is a, is a critical way that we are really trying to leverage the health argument per se uh, to, 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 to accelerate this transition. So I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, Heather. Rob, uh, do you have something to add at this stage? Yeah. I mean, you, you emphasize the, the synergy actually of uh, actions uh, on energy if to, to protect climate, uh, which evidently uh, is, is, is more efficient when you take into, uh, into account uh, health issues. There is not the only analysis. We have quite a few such assessments which do show synergy um, in, in mon monetary terms, but usually in global dimension, which is a bit abstract, I would say, mm -hmm. to individual countries and certainly to individual communities how to, to turn this uh, joint message uh, together to, to be convincing and influencing uh, decision-making? That's a key question. Um, and, and again, thanks for this opportunity. I'm, you know, I have one foot in the health world, but that's not really my core focus. And I think it's, it's important for you know, us to, to look across in, into different themes and try and understand what we can learn. Um, <laughs> Funding in this space is woefully inadequate, and the health argument alone is not sufficient to bring in funding. Right? I think you know estimates for funding a, a full full on household energy transition in low middle income countries or something like you know require on the order of you know several billion per year, and uh, you know the current funding is is about you know ten percent of that, and it fluctuates from year to year. So it's even that's not certain. Um, and I think you really need to leverage these other impact channels, let's say, potential benefits, climate, forest, land cover, uh, because that's where the money is, you know, um, you know for, for better or worse, um, you know, health just cannot generate the, the funding that's required. Um, and to some degree, climate has. It's also generated a lot of, of interest in infrastructure and better M&E tools. Um, and also revealed that you know things are not working quite as as advertised, uh, which is important for practitioners and researchers to understand. Uh, so I think you know all of these have to be pulled together, and and that's where the challenge lies. Uh, you know when you then drill down to a national or subnational level, uh, these communities don't necessarily communicate with one another. Um, you know the the ministries, the the civil society groups that are essential to to operationalizing uh, any action. Um, you know they have their their core concerns, and there's you know all sorts of institutional histories why that's so. Um, and I think, you know, without muddling the field and saying, oh, it's super complicated, you know, we need to get these communities talking, you know, at, at all levels, international, national, subnational. Right. Well, it is complicated. <laughs> it is true, but uh, a lot of uh, it is in uh, communication on various levels. And uh, what is important is that we have the the uh, impacts of the situation also on various levels. We do have, um, a, let's say, uh, my global scale, 
climate uh, issues are are global, and it doesn't matter where you 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 have the emissions, uh, you you have the impacts uh, uh, in the future, and you have micro scale and. Uh, micro scale uh, related also to the map, uh, this distorted map of poverty, <laughs> which Kalpana have shown, um, this global map again. But when you zoom uh, inside countries, then you you may have similar maps on even on a community level. And, and here is a question: How uh, we address uh, or do is a, is there merit? to address um, those uh, uh, issues of, of fuel uh, uh, poverty, of uh, uh, in a, inequalities on a local level. I mean, they, they might be a hindering part in this transition because um, I would say in, in all societies, the uh, more affluent part uh, will manage this way or the other way. Uh, globally and and uh, and locally but will uh, everywhere will have a part of population which uh, will have uh, problems uh, with this transition uh, who thinks uh, in terms of, of days or or weeks uh, sometimes to survive or, or to, to, to live a normal life um, and we are talking about something which will happen or not happen in in uh, decades, if we are talking about health, or in uh, half a century, if we are talking um, uh, about climate, um, how to address this part of population, not only in terms of communication, because talking is, I would say, easy. Uh, we can talk, and, and uh, there will be obviously a barrier of uh, not only understanding, but uh, priorities. Uh, in uh, normal life. So what to do to improve uh, our public health and global climate by actions uh, perhaps directed to uh, some uh, selected community. And, and now uh, if there are no questions from the, or comments uh, from the floor, uh, I will ask Anna, to start it, you specialized in this issue of inequalities. Um, go ahead, Anna, please. Thank you very much. So excellent question. So basically, what I think uh, we need to understand is um, uh, from the point of view of the energy vulnerable households, how, what is their lived experience? And this is what I, I've studied. They are very aware that they are contributing to air pollution, and they also have adverse uh, um, uh, health impacts on themselves, but this is for them uh, accepted reality. So they, they, they accept that, okay, so I'm going to have a smoke uh, in, my, in my flat, uh, or more or less uh, low quality of, uh, of even illegal dwelling, I'm going to have, but at least I'm going to be warm. So it's like sometimes a uh, choice between two, uh, what is worse. And it also, and I just like so this is the, the, expo the acceptance of exposure uh, to, to, uh, to indoor pollution, but it's also there is uh, acceptance of reduced energy needs, like some kind of a heating only one room, and then uh, there is a situation that whole family spends um, four uh, uh, months of the winter in one room, so it's also kind of a fight. Um, uh, reducing uh, their, their uh, let's say, daily, daily activities to, to spending in one room. And in terms of, of what we can do, is so, so first we have to understand this. So it's their, their uh, it's their living on this subsistence. They're living on this constant stress that they have to kind of um, somehow survive or, or because in, in countries that, for example, uh, that are, for example, uh, that there is more uh, rent, uh, then they would maybe lose the access to, to the dwelling. In other, uh, in other contexts when they own the dwelling, so maybe they, they won't use it, but actually it would be definitely the, the question whether they would be, uh, they, they would be uh, cold. Um, and um, there is also definitely the need of uh, kind of a recognition from the point of view of institutions and uh, what, um, uh, we from the researchers from the uh, studying energy poverty, we want to go one step back. So instead of addressing health in impacts or even energy poverty, we have to address the drivers of energy poverty. 
So what is causing these these uh, these impacts? And then basically we can kind of say that that and if we actually do um, calculation of how much cost would be spent, and I, I'm also even talking about not just the, the very visible air pollution that really happens in in many capitals and. Um, cities across Eastern Europe that's very visible in winter, but also the mental health. I mean, there's been a kind of a discussion that how, how people are really addicted to to um, to um, to pills to to kind of deal with, with their with their anxiety and stress. So if we kind of calculate this this health of how much we would save and how much the benefits would be, and of course there's awareness and support of the institutions, this would be uh, this would be uh, good. And just want to example uh, to mention one example. I don't know if I can bring out my, to share my slide, just one uh, slide, I think I can. Uh, are you able to see it? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, so, we, uh, we see it. Yeah. Yes, the okay. font is very small, I must admit. So on our yes, it's screen, just, uh, it's difficult to read. It's just uh, it's just like an illustration, so not uh, not to read. Uh, I will explain. Uh, this is a very example, a good example of um, um, of um, wind energy, which is a public uh, energy supplier, public uh, uh, utility uh, in uh, in the in Vienna capital of Austria, and they have a special unit that's called Ombudsman. It's kind of independent. It's mostly so uh, um, kind of a contact point for. Uh, for uh, consumers uh, usually who cannot pay their bills or have some kind of a problem. And uh, they've been, uh, they're in very well um, contact with social institutions in, in Austria and they keep getting um, um, uh, requests from people who cannot pay their energy bills and they realize that there is definitely this link to ma between material deprivation and energy poverty. And they even went so much further that they made their own uh, definition of severe social case. This is how it's called, and it's even a broader a notion of an energy vulnerable a household or a consumer. And has um, six main points and kind of a several. Um, as you can see, uh, not to read, but just uh, to see how many points they they develop. And if you, as a consumer, match three of these um, points, you can actually uh, you are considered this case. And then they have a special way of uh, of kind of a helping you. Um, uh, deal with the with, uh, energy or being able to pay the energy bills. And one of the, I just want to point out, one of these um, uh, uh, six core elements is illness. And there is like a seven, seven different variables. So this is an example of an institution, of institutional innovation, I would say. And uh, they've really uh, helped a lot. And I've read some of the um, 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 letters of, of, uh, of the uh, consumers that have. So this is one way of, uh, kind of at least not cutting people off from supply of electricity or heating, but kind of uh, getting in dialogue with them, kind of uh, recognizing as how illness can contribute to energy poverty. I think I would. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna. This is uh, important. I see Dan here from uh, Dan Greenbaum uh, from the floor wants to help us in this discussion. Please go ahead, Dan. Thank you. Uh, this, this, this is a use, very useful discussion and, and obviously a challenge to figure out how we can accelerate the changes that are going on in a protective way. Uh, I'm actually, even though I'm, I'm Dan Greenbaum from the Health Effects Institute, sorry for those of you who don't know me. Um, um, and, and it may be odd what I'm gonna say, given that I'm coming from the Health Effects Institute, um, but the cultural nature of this, and, and Anna was just, I, and, the, and the multiple dimensions of the decision-making make me think that we need to think beyond just health in, in how we deal with this. And let me tell you a story. Um, 40 years ago, I was walking with my wife through an old section of Col Kolkata. It was known as Calcutta then. Um, and we walked by a plumbing shop and there was a sign in the window that said, running water, your family deserves it. Um, and that wasn't unique to India. Um, it was suggesting, and of course, there's been much, much progress in 40 years over that. But it was suggesting something much broader than what are the health benefits of running water? What are the economic benefits of running water? It was, it, it was suggesting a lifestyle change and a modernization of life. 
And um, I wonder, and it, this happened to be a small private sector plumber, but I wonder if, uh, if we've thought about what are the opportunities to uh, marshal that kind of marketing capability for those who have an interest in getting the better stoves and the other pieces in there. In the countries we're talking about, the cell phone industry has marketed, everybody has a cell phone or many, the vast majority of people have them. Um, perhaps to our problem, a, a very large number of people are riding around on two wheelers that whether it's Bajaj in India or others who've sold them, but the marketing has been, you need this. And I'm wondering if there aren't partners, because there are people who sell these better, uh, sell uh, better stoves, better appliances, other things, whether anybody's been thinking, whether WHO or others have been thinking about how do we build that kind of proactive partnership? Because this, I, this is culturally very difficult. I, under, I, I, I know all of the issues around stove stacking and other stuff, but is there a, is there a way to jumpstart this in a different way with, um, with that being careful because the marketing and the advertising business can, can create unintended consequences that you don't want. So just a thought, um, health is part of it. Obviously I, I work for the Health Facts Institute, but, but uh, just a suggestion of about a broader approach. Thank you, Dan. Perhaps uh, I will ask uh, Sumi to address this issue. I mean, looking from, and, and perhaps also Kalpana looking from so, um, country perspective or local perspective, how this chain of, <laughs> of, of, of information at least or, or promotion uh, can work. Have you seen it in, yes. in, in uh, sure. practice? Uh, can think, it work? Uh, yes, and I think this is an area where it's, it's really good for us to remember not to oversimplify sometimes. I think this is a complicated issue. Often people will kind of get stuck in thinking about all of the cultural and behavioral aspects of this. But at the end of the day, if you look at every country around the world, the people at, with the highest economic status and access yeah. have all shifted over um, to clean household yeah. energy, right? So it's something which, you know, as Dan, you rightly mentioned, it is something which is aspirational. It's something which people really, they, they want to use if they can afford it, if they have reliable access to it. I think, unfortunately, one of the challenges that we've seen is that when we're talking about kind of energy policies, these are normally focused on large scale energy and energy for people that can already afford it. If you look in many times, even at the country level, the energy modeling scenarios, when they're thinking about how much energy they need to generate, don't necessarily include a focus on, um, on cooking or heating, which can actually be quite intensive. So this is something that we also have to keep in mind. If you're thinking about switching over, are you going to consider having enough energy available? Um, and on the flip side, it's true that it's not just a health issue, but at the same time, um, you know, we've talked, I think, a lot today in the session about how to bring the health into um, the energy and air quality space. I think the other issue that we have to think about, which is very related to the issue of raising awareness and really creating demand for these clean energy solutions to say, okay, what can we do to bring this issue into the health space? Why should the health sector care and get engaged in this issue, right? What, why are they bothered? You know, what kinds of, po of kind of policy analyses, like, you know, Rob showed, um, Heather talked about some of the cost benefit analyses, but specifically for the health sector, how much, and we've seen this more broadly on air quality management in the US, how compelling it is when people see how much um, resources are actually being lost due to excessive hospitalizations, hospital visits, um, you know, time spent um, due to illness, you know, how can we have those kinds of really policy relevant data that really speak to the limited constraints of health sectors that are already stretched in trying to go about their day-to-day -day activities? And as we do that, how can we then also engage the health sector to really increase awareness to their patients, but also to policymakers who will trust them to say, look, this is a health issue that we need to really start to be concerned about. Thank you, Sumi. Kalpana, maybe you cannot. Yeah, very quickly, um, totally agree. You know, uh, the, the point that Sumi made, you know, hits the issue bang on. It's multidimensional poverty and it's economic affordability. You know, LPG or other clean energy uses 
um, you know, there may be many, many, many barriers, but they continue to remain aspirational. And for people to provide, fulfill their aspirations, we have to find alternative models of making that, um, that uh, you know, make, make enabling them to cross that affordability barrier. And what Dan mentioned, uh, you know, all these, um, um, you know, including the cell phone analogy um, is because the cost of the technology is now so affordable. So if the cell phone were to cost, you know, 3000, uh, well, it does cost 3000 rupees now, but if it were to cost 30,000 rupees, you know, annually, it's not going to be something that the, uh, you know, it's, it's beyond that, you know, aspiration and affordability are a, uh, 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 you know, are a strange, uh, you know, are strange enemies of uh, each other. And, uh, and we need to sort of really enable this process where health becomes the argument for bringing down the affordability barrier. And then we can sort of push up the aspiration uh, just hard enough. You know, it was clearly a major part of the, 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 the LPG access campaign, uh, fulfilling aspirations for being modern, for being, uh, you know, um, something that every woman deserves, every family deserves. And that was a major part of getting the access, but it's not enough to get uh, you know, uh, the health benefits uh, from use of that clean technology. So just some thoughts to sort of really bottom line is to sort of really, you know, improve the affordability to a point where people would naturally transition. Right. So don't wait uh, possibly for, uh, until all yeah. society gets rich and, rich, and exactly. afford. No. How do you yeah. We have question and I see there also we have question from uh, the uh, people connected, uh, people uh, Yeah, uh, Chad Bailey from the USCPA, Office of Transportation and Air Quality. Uh, I think it was in the New Deal, 1936 or so, That and so I apologize in advance if this is parochial and nationalistic sounding, but um, FDR signed the Rural Electrification Act, or, or I think it was called, in like 1936, and that was transformative for rural America. It connected power plants and to, you know, you know, you were, could burn an electric, you had an electric bulb and things like that. So I guess one of my questions is when, in terms of this discussion, I mean, that was an infrastructure law. That was an infrastructure law that had an enormous health and economic impact. I guess my question is when we're dealing with this type of transformation that you guys are talking about, how much is this being considered an infrastructure transformation question? And if not, should it be? Thank you. Import, important question. Of it was tackled, uh, I think, in presentations. Uh, infrastructure, the simplest in infrastructure, which was already mentioned by uh, Rob, is uh, this gas uh, uh, distribution in infrastructure. This relatively simple uh, thing, but it also takes time and uh, effort to develop. But it, there must be a demand. And must be, uh, when there is uh, demand, there should be uh, supply. So, Rob, do you have something to add? On? Sure, and that, that's a that's a key point. Um, and it's this is where the the disconnect between health needs and other sectoral priorities really comes to the fore. I think. Um, yeah, absolutely. You can't do any of this without infrastructure, whether it's, you know, the grid extension or LPG, you know, uh, handling and distribution, uh, storage tanks, trucks, et cetera. Uh, even the cylinders themselves, they have to either be manufactured or imported in order, in order to, to get that last mile, so to speak. And countries that have made those investments are further ahead than countries that have not. You know, it's, it's a fairly, it, it's a simple statement, but it, it backs a lot of complicated right, policies and political economy and, and you know, all of those things. And again, health is not a driver of those decisions in most cases. Uh, you know, I, yeah, well, I'll, I'll stop there. Not, but, not, not but it a could driver, be. But, but can be a facilitating argument, it, let's say. It, it, it could be, but yeah, but um, it's, it's not, you know, those are, you know, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Infrastructure, Ministry of Petroleum and, you know, Energy, and those, you know, rarely, you know, take health as a, as a main driver. Maybe, you know, there's a, there's a guy in the room, but it's, it's not typically, uh, you know, the, the voice is not loud, let's say. Well, there's this unfortunate position, unfortunate or unfortunate position of health. That uh, it's uh, create, I mean, defining problems, but not usually not 
solving the problem. Yeah. Somebody else needs to step in and uh, and yeah. uh, solve the problem. Uh, I want to listen to uh, other comments. We still have five minutes uh, to go and. Uh, uh, so there's a question from Ajay Pilari Sati, who's asking. Oh yes, um, there's a question from Ajay Pilari Sati, who's asking that on the discussion of health, the types of evidence that the health community prefers, which is randomized trials, does not necessarily match the outcomes of interest, which are results of years of exposure. So looking ahead, what are the best steps forward for any type of accountability studies that we want to conduct on this topic? Yeah, so uh, Ajay was asking, um, and I can have the panelists respond to that, but Ajay was asking if, you know, the, the types of um, progress that we have made on the health side from on the research side uh, on household air pollution do not compare to the progress that we have made on the exposure side of things. So if we were to mount new accountability studies, what would be the most efficient way to sort of uh, you know, use past research to sort of add efficiency to the accountability studies. So Sumi, would you like to respond? And yes, and, and I would say that in some ways, this very much mirrors, I think, what we um, what we see on on the the research in, in ambient air quality. And actually, um, thank you, Ajit. I feel like the HEI annual conference is the perfect place to raise this question because, on the one hand, we see that the research questions never never end. There's always more information um, to and, and you know knowledge to be learned. Learn, but at the same time, we have more than enough evidence to actually start moving. And I think um, just as we don't see um, at this conference um, a, a lion's share of the focus on RCTs for obvious reasons, I think, um, you know, for the household energy too, thinking about what the key questions are that we'd really like to focus in on. Um, and then think about the types of methodologies, you know, we're really most interested in thinking about what are the solutions that are going to reduce exposure the most um, and really focusing more in on implementation science approaches or accountability studies as people um, tend to think about them in terms of really being able to see measurable benefits um, to um, over, over time. And ideally for this issue, also we want to think about looking at a focus on solutions that can be taken at scale. So moving away from this focus on kind of, you know, unique and kind of boutique types of household energy solutions that a few people may be able to take up to really think about what can we really do just um, to really, um, you know, rise to the occasion and try to aspire to get to the types of scenarios that Rob shared, for example. Thank you. We have a few minutes left. Uh, I want this to give to uh, Shonali and uh, Paul. Uh, in very short sentence, what would you do to, I mean, we do have a problem. Uh, what would you recommend very briefly as a first step to, towards solution of the problem? Shonali and then Paul, please, very briefly. Thank you very much. So, I mean, I think a lot has been said and, uh, you know, it is a complicated issue. And of course, uh, we've heard a lot about it. But I think increasingly we are understanding from not just the health perspective, but we really need to be looking at this from a cross-sector intervention perspective. You know, we really need to be thinking about the gender co-benefits, the time use co-benefits that we've heard about, climate and pollution, of course. But also, like, when we're looking at the very nitty gritty household level, we know from the RCTs that have been done that the results are not unequivocal when we're looking at only clean cooking access. When we are looking at um, all kinds of environmental you know, uh, sanitation uh, infrastructure for the household, whether that's water, uh, clean cooking, electricity, uh, you know, proper housing. When we're looking at all of these together, that's where you're getting the biggest bang for your buck. Yeah. And that's what we need to be doing in terms of addressing this issue. Yeah. Thank you, Sonali. Uh, Paul, your um, recipe well, for <laughs> the future. Um, I don't think there is a simple recipe. What, what, um, and I'm not sure what really I can add to all that you said before. What, what seems to me important is to recognize that the, there is no simple solution to this or no single answer, as um, I'm sure everyone understands. Um, and I think actually a lot of the potential uh, benefits and the health arguments are actually well understood by many as well. Um, I don't actually see that that is really where most of the gap is. 
I mean, there are plenty of countries now that are uh, investing in programs for, because of the health, you know, motivated by health arguments in relation to energy. Uh, there are countries that are, uh, that are uh, doing programs of home energy efficiency to treat illness uh, on the NHS in the UK, uh, in Ireland and, and elsewhere. So there are plenty of ways in which people are recognizing health consequences and taking actions uh, uh, um, correspondingly. The issue often, I think, is one really of, of implementation and recognizing how to get things to happen. That's part of that mapping where you, the direction of travel, and there are some very big directions that need to be clearly articulated and understood, but those increasingly are being mapped out now, especially in higher income settings, but increasingly also in lower income settings. But the, the implementation of how you achieve change, the behavior change, the, how you actually arrive at where you want to get to is more of an issue. And in that, even your very first question to us, what is the value of making a health argument in those decisions? Because those are big decisions that cut across the whole economy. And we should be kidding ourselves to think that they're only going to be driven by health arguments. No, of course, they are driven by many more powerful uh, factors as well, including, as one former US president said, it's the economy stupid. And that's what's dominating at the moment. It's the cost of energy, it's the security of energy. And then there are things about, well, how else can we then apply that? So it's a complicated mix. And I think it needs both kind of the macro level thinking to ensure that we don't get diverted away from the right uh, pathways, but also the more micro level uh, schemes that can try to exploit the opportunities which we know there for implementing things at local level to improve access to clean energy, wherever that may be. Thank you, Paul. And that was the last uh, statement uh, in, in, in this discussion. We regret you are not here uh, with us, but we thank uh, very much, uh, I thank very much to uh, all of you who are connected remotely uh, using the technology and uh, reducing carbon footprint of this uh, conference uh, uh, at the same occasion. But still, we regret you are not there. I thank uh, very much to the participants of the panel and lecturers. We do have a problem. Uh, we recognize uh, it not uh, just now, but but um, it is with us, and uh, the pro we, we see the pro progress. Uh, um, but um, I am uh, concerned that this progress may, may be affected by current uh, situation and and difficulties which we have in uh, front of us. But um, as mentioned by Shonali, uh, using all kinds of arguments and working together with various sectors, <laughs> emphasizing synergies. Uh, of action synergies. Uh, well, we were talking mostly about climate and health, but what uh, what uh, uh, Kalpana has has shown it's also progress in terms of, of social program progress is uh, progress in uh, increasing uh, equity. So uh, it is really issue which is affects uh, all uh, various issues. It requires, as Rob mentioned, it requires joint action and usually not one sector, but uh, yeah, many sectors of uh, government. And last but not least, it, I do believe it requires also action on various <laughs> geographical levels. Because those problems will not be solved by the poorest countries, where the problem is mainly. Uh, we have the problem in uh, high income countries as well, but the uh, bulk of the problem is there. And I think um, it is also important to emphasize that uh, action um, in uh, uh, low income countries will benefit uh, all globe. Uh, so we have to remember that uh, the money spent, uh, which will be necessary, money spent there will affect uh, uh, people uh, all over the globe. So, uh, and, and we have arguments. We have, okay, we have models. We don't want to wait for the proofs, <laughs> but um, uh, we have very strong arguments uh, we, which have to be used on various levels. So thank you very much for the session. Th thank you for um, participation, remote participation and uh, in place. And I think we have time for break.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.